It's Comics Are Great, the visual storytelling show recorded live every other Wednesday at the Ann Arbor District Library in lovely downtown Ann Arbor, Michigan, on the corner of Fifth and William. Uh, the show is streamed live at comicsgreat.tv. Uh, and then collect the leader as a podcast at comic, comicsaregreat.com and uh, youtube.com slash comicsaregreat. And uh, there's a big announcement coming up about a new destination for Comics Are Great at the Ooh. end of the show. Uh, we'll have to wait for that because, uh, you know, due deference, got to uh, get to the really important biz- business first. Uh, and that would be our guest today. This, this, is, this is why I do this podcasting stuff because it allows me to rub elbows with the greatest people in I, art. I think really we should talk about Neil first. <laughs> oh, oh, he's starting early today, everybody. Paul Story of Storyville.com. But Why are you? <laughs> <laughs> we've got already the... with the funny. <laughs> we've got a man who does not only a great Jerry Lewis, but probably the best Gilbert Gottfried in the business. Uh, Mr. Well, Neil... technically that's not true. That would be Gilbert. <laughs> Gilbert does do a pretty good Gilbert Gottfried. <laughs> you know that's always a good thing. Follow up the professional with yeah, thanks. Yeah, yeah. I know. <laughs> and you with that. Wow. No, <laughs> sorry, I, I'll I'll res- I'll I'll resist from now no, on. No, 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 you go ahead. <laughs> you. I've already lost this one. It's already off the rails. But we got Neil Kaplan on the show, Yay. and I was going to start by being all respectful of everything because this man. Oh gosh, let's go through his credits real quick for those who don't. I don't think you can go through them real quick. No, you can. Actually, He's... you can. Uh, Digimon. You were uh, played Hawkmon on Digimon Digital Monsters. Uh, I know some fans of the show are big fans of Digimon. Uh, then also, uh, oh well, I guess we could talk about Transformers World Within Disguise. Anybody who's watched this show for any amount of time is well aware that uh, you know I'm, I'm kind of a Transformers fan. And uh, you played uh, Optimus Prime on that series, one of the best Transformers series, in my opinion, because it was the one where they came along and said, you know what, would it kill us to make the kids laugh every once in a while? It was one of the first shows that was in a long time that was actually genuinely funny. Well, uh, a lot of that, I think, was uh, was was Peter Spellos. I think his work as Skybite, you know, deserves interrupting you and making note of. He was, he was fantastic. I wouldn't exactly say that, uh, that I, I hope, uh, my performance as Optimus Prime wasn't one of the comedic linchpins of the show. Yeah, yeah, Skybite for those. Who, I, I actually encourage anybody who is a fan of comedy and, and good cartoons to watch this series, even if you're not a Transformers fan, because uh, one of the things they introduced was this character named Skybite, who was a bad guy. Uh, Neil, I think you coined it best. You said he was uh, something like a Shakespearean uh, villain who is forced into the role of second banana. And uh, yeah. and, he, and he secretly wants to be a poet, and so he's composing haikus in the battlefield. He's very emotional, prone to violent mood swings, uh, where he'll be crying in one scene and then uh, full of himself in the next scene. You, you identify with Skybite a lot. Don't you? I think all of us uh, identify with Skybite. He speaks to the best and worst in all of us. He's a great character, but but all, equally great was the role of Optimus Prime in that series. So yeah, Transformers: Robots in Disguise. People should watch it. You were in Power Rangers for crying out loud. Power Rangers time uh, for s- several several seasons actually. Uh, 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 before uh, Time Force um, and uh, and Lightspeed Rescue, um, I would play intermittent villains or just background villains. Like um, the uh, in uh, the film, I of course was an oozling, and and to tell you how memorable that was, uh, I was watching HBO one day and the movie came on and I was all. Oh, you know that would have been fun to work on that, and then all of a sudden I hear. <laughs> And I go, oh, that's right. I did work on that. <laughs> <laughs> ah, the memory. Hopefully we'll see you at Power Morphicon this summer and in Pasadena. Oh, when is that? This summer? Um, <laughs> I think it's like August uh, 19th-ish, something like that. Power Morphicon. So they're bringing in, they're bringing in uh, Power Rangers from around the world, and uh, you'll see a bunch of us. Old voice actors stumbling around, you know. A lot of the voice cast, we 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 go to it because it's in our backyard and it gives us the chance to get back together um, and regale each other with with tales of day gone by or days or whatever. You know, I'm working on three hours of sleep here. They can't all be gems. That's that's the other that's the other thing we need to make uh, a point out of is that Neil is here with a sinus infection and running on three hours of sleep. This man Whee! is a prince. For making the time to be on the show, uh, you also worked on Naruto. Is that right? 
Um, I well, it's I've just recently been allowed to say that I am the voice of Madara Uchiha. Oh wow! So yeah, you're... so that's like you know, that's like a, a deal, you know, a big <laughs> deal or whatever. Uh, I've played incidental roles before, and so now it's nice to actually play a um uh at least a temporarily running character. That is uh, super, super cool. So you're on the same show as Tara Platt and Yuri Lowenthal, uh, two other voice actors that I had the pleasure. It is two of my favorites in the business. They are they are uh, not only fantastically talented, but so incredibly nice. Um, it, and 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 you know, I mean, fun to look at, and everything you hate in other human beings. <laughs> That's an awful lot. <laughs> Yeah, no, that's what I'm saying is it's like, really, you can't just have one of those things. You know, they're married, they're happy, they're, they're, they're friendly, you know, uh, talented. It's like, wow, really? Yeah. Spread the wealth here, kids, yeah. please. <laughs> <laughs> well, wait a second. You, you were re- uh, I'm going to show how badly I am at measuring time. You're fairly how recent. How badly you are at measuring time? How badly I am at talking, too. Uh, how badly I am at speaking. <laughs> And I've had a full six hours, seven hours of sleep. But uh, you, you, you just recently got married too. Recently speaking, in terms of like in, within yeah, the past five yeah, years, in the, so. fall. In, in the fall. But congratulations. Uh, interestingly, en- interestingly enough, we uh, um, met actually uh, back when the Mets won the World Series. We'll just say that. Awesome. So yeah, get Mazel Tov. Uh, but, but going back to hey. Tara ter- 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 and Yuri, uh, two very lucky people. I want to take an opportunity to plug a book that they wrote which is called voice over voice actor what it's like behind the mic who guess guess who did the cartoons in that book this kid who yeah me that's right wow. i got to i worked on a book with them so uh yeah people can go check it out it's at bug bugbotpress.com slash book so you got neil's endorsement that they're good people and then you can see drawings and, of them and they, know, and they know their stuff and they and they know their stuff good enough for jersey not to bring them down <laughs> I, I don't put anybody down. On no, show. no, bring them down. Oh, with your, I see. Despite with your, my cartoons, despite, despite well, they wrote cartoons. the cartoons. I just did the art. So. Oh, well, see. see, they were safe. And actually, you're quite a talented cartoon. Oh, look at him! Uh, but then we got to get through Neil's video game credits yeah, too, because man, this guy just—he's done everything. He's—you're uh, in Transformers: Revenge of the Fallen. You play Long Haul in that game. Right. It was fun to actually say, "I'm going to kill you, Optimus Prime." <laughs> <laughs> Hey, flip side of the coin. <laughs> Ninja Gaiden, Sig- uh, Sigma 2, Final Fantasy 13, and we should mention this is probably a big important one StarCraft because uh well, two, you know, don't don't tease the folks. That that's sort of like saying, you know, Lando Calrissian was in Star Wars. Oh, oh my mistake. I'm, no worries. People are already yelling in the chat. <laughs> No, they're not. You are in StarCraft too, you buffoon! <laughs> but I just love the fact that Neil is one of the good and right people who refers to Star Wars as Star Wars. What do you mean? Well, that's because I was around when it came out, <laughs> and that's the movie I saw. <laughs> I have arguments with people that, in fact, the original scroll did not say A New Hope. It didn't. I know it didn't. I was there. It didn't. <laughs> It didn't, it's, and it's an insult. You know? It no, is. It's it, like, yeah. yeah. It's like these kids look, going look, like, no, really, it look, was there. I've I've worked for Mr. Lucas, Ooh. you know, uh, under that giant tree. I've done, you know, uh, four um, Star Wars video games, um, and I'd certainly love to work under that tree again, but I still – they they Luke and Leia weren't brother and sister in that first movie come on i I would argue they weren't in that second oh my gosh so we're gonna get through the rest of neil's credits (laughs) (laughs) let let me fly my geek flag (laughs) come come on Uh, well we gotta plug we gotta plug something of yours neil because this is another thing this is something i spent money on and i encourage other people to spend money on too and uh, you uh did the reading of the audiobook starcraft 2 heaven's devils which is a great book and it's Read, it's read terrifically by Neil. No, I, I really enjoyed doing that, and uh, uh, the 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 sequel book, Devils Do, is great. They just unfortunately didn't do an audio book version. And you know, I met Christy Golden at Comic Con, the the writer of the book, and she gave me one of the biggest compliments I've ever gotten, which was the book was so easy to write because I could hear you. 
That and sounds like, like a segue, too. <laughs> you know, you just sit there and go, oh, thank you, little lady. That's awful kind. Well, I mean, that's that's the thing about this book, and this is why I want to plug it. For, this is the first book recommendation, an audio book. It's, it's so good because... It's a well-written story, but then you're also hearing a master storyteller who knows how to use his voice to make the it, – it doesn't feel like a radio drama. It feels like you're just – you're getting a really excellent reading from a really good tale, right? Mm -hmm. And the way, Neil, that you can kick into like a really young voice to a really – I'm sure that – Possibly some editing going on there, but you can kick from like 17 to 65 in the drop of a hat, the spin of a spin of a dime, or whatever the expression I, is. For I that. heard you did it all in one take, Neil. Yeah, that's what I heard too. Uh, yeah, all 14 hours of it. One <laughs> take. <laughs> um, you are a quite, master. Not quite, um, but you know, it certainly is different uh, as a voiceover actor who spends most of his time doing um, video games where. You know, I mean, now I, I guess we are getting more monologues, but for the most part, a lot of it's quick lines and, you know, sentences here and there. And then to transition over to reading pages at a time uh, certainly was different, you know, for me. And look, the the whole experience of, of, of doing that book was was very educational for me. Um and 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 a lot of fun and i thought that they that the story was great um and really kind of opened up kind of a butch and sundance kind of a period um for these two really well created characters you know and only time will tell um what will end up happening with them um, I, i'm just glad i i got the chance to uh play tychus a couple of times you know well, people should support it by buying the book, uh, the audio books, and then they'll hire you to do more books. That would be really great. Well, thank you. I did actually do the um, – speaking of doing younger voices, I actually did the audio books for I Am Number 4 and the sequel, The Power of Six. Ooh, ah. <laughs> and, the, and I'm waiting for the new next sequel, 789. <laughs> Yeah, why was six afraid of seven? That old one. Yeah, uh, but okay, sure, because so... you had to explain that one. Right? <laughs> Thanks, that, was sort of the, that was sort of the Jeopardy way of telling a joke, wasn't it? Oh my <laughs> god, I'm getting tag teamed by here by these two guys. Uh, this is going to be a popular one. I know. Whenever people give me a hard time, it always it does good for the ratings. Uh, so, but yeah, what I what I want to talk about today is people are probably oh. asking who are watching the show, saying, "Well, geez, it's a comic show." Uh, well, we should mention that Neil also writes comic books. Uh, Eyeofthewolf dot com. Anybody uh, go there? Uh, I, I certainly I certainly try to, and we're we're you know um, unfortunately the economy hit the production pretty hard. Um, and we're trying to get that back up and done, um, because we, you know, have my having gone to different parts of the world and kind of tease people with the story. A lot of people want to know what happens with it. Um, because the only thing that's been out, out there on the market was the, uh, kind of teaser first chapter. Um, so we're hoping that, um, you know, we're going to be able to finish that up. So I appreciate you talking about it. Well, yeah, that's yeah. We'll put it in the show notes. I have the wolf dot com, so people can see that you have uh, every reason to be here on a comic show, but also well, and it, and in fact, I'm I'm teased it before, but Optimus, we're going to be releasing that as a uh, strip web series. We should we should mention we should talk about what Optimus is because uh, I haven't talked to you in a couple of years, and so let's let's refresh everybody's minds as to what Optimus. Where where no can we problem. find more about that? Uh, well. Right now, uh, just on Facebook, at All Hail Optimus. Um, Optimus actually uh, originated from me doing uh, Optimus Prime, and it would be between takes, and I would just be kind of silly, and you know, I'd read uh, read things a little differently. Autobots transform, you know, and just have some fun with it. And then <laughs> Optimus kind of was born out of trying to break up the the guys in the booth. Um, I, I don't remember any specific lines from any games or any um, or any uh, shows that I've worked on very often, but I do remember working on this one game because the line was so perfect for Optimus. It was, I strike from the shadows. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought that that was just so brilliant, and I just kind of would talk about Optimus, and a friend of mine who's a comic book artist in Great Britain 
Um, Simon Williams, uh, who's incredibly talented, uh, worked on uh, the Hulk and uh, Transformers out in the uh, UK. So anybody out in Europe uh, who, who's looked at uh, Marvel in the last, I don't know, 10, 15 years is familiar with his work. Um, but he actually did some mock-up uh, uh, you know, pages for Optimus, including, I believe, uh, Galva Bunny as one of the uh, villains. <laughs> oh, man. Um, yeah, and it was pretty funny, and I wanted to do something with that, but I kind of feared getting into some copyright issues, you know, with uh, some certain mega corporations out there. So we made some adjustments, and as I would talk to an animator friend of mine, um, we we kind of realized that, you know, if we wanted to have all these adventures with Optimus, the best thing for him to be would be an actor, you know? Because then if we wanted to, you know, have Optimus have an adventure in an anime style, well, that would just be a TV show that he was working on. And if we wanted to go with something more cinematic, then that would be a movie that he was working on. Because ultimately we were sitting around and we figured out about, I don't know, nine different origin stories for, for Optimus and how could those all be supported. And it was just, well, the only way to slip a character into so many different things is make him an actor yeah and then um, and then it broadens your storytelling potential with lots and lots of different kinds of send-ups and settings and approaches exactly. and styles so, yeah so we have our first season which is actually a, a setup for uh, a, a movie that that he is making with his friend uh uh billy bitter beaver <laughs> bitter being his nickname you know although he likes to say i'm not bitter I'm just kind of angry. That that's, that that sounds really like someone I know. <laughs> well, you know, uh, Billy represents all those actors who keep getting cast in in parts, and they're thankful to be working. But but ultimately, how do I say this? Um, they play the uh, the ethnic Seven Eleven clerk in the episode of Twenty Four, where the Seven Eleven gets shot up. Mm -hmm. um, they play the red-shirted crewman in Star Trek. You know, I yeah. mean, happy for the day's work, but it's like, really, can I not stick around for a little while? <laughs> and, and, and the biggest problem of all is that Optimus got his start as a bit player on, 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 on Billy's TV show. And so ultimately he overshadowed, overshadowed him, much like Michael J. Fox did to... Uh, to uh, Michael Gross in Family Ties. Uh, I, see, I for sure thought you were going to go for Meredith Baxter. I thought you were going to go for Teeny Others. But uh, anyway... Uh, <laughs> well, who wouldn't go for Teeny Others? <laughs> a huge star going in. Yeah. Right. Uh, come now. Uh, right. Uh, so, okay, so that's any, it. I'll, any, I'll... Anybody... It, a friend of mine wrote this, and, and I think it's, it's, it's perfect, but you want me to depress you? <laughs> I Remember that it's... wonderful movie... Um, uh, Back to the Future, yeah. where they went back to the 30 years, the quaint old year of 1955. Yeah. Well, if we went back 30 years, we'd be in quaint old 1982 watching Star Trek II, The Wrath of Khan. Well, that does make me feel a little bit sad. Uh, but yeah. And old. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, I'm reliably informed by someone in the uh, in the chat that you're only as old as you feel. No, well, that's true. Somebody said, did say that in the chat. Is that and, with your right I'm, hand or your left hand? I was going to say my uh, oh, yes, wow. my arthritic <laughs> digits. I I feel very old. Uh, but okay, but I, that's a good segue to talk about the chat for a second because we are doing this new thing. Matt Dubay, producer of the show, did this really cool thing where he set up where uh, there's a Twitter stream and anybody who uses the hashtag Comics Are Great on Twitter to uh, do any kind of live responses to what we're talking about today. Uh, it w it will be anybody who's watching the video is seeing this on the show. So it's your way to participate on the show. I'm watching the the stream. Uh, I have a search going for the Comics Great hashtag. If you've got an interesting question, thought, or uh, insert that you want on the show, I will be glad to uh, bring it up and bring it to Neil's attention. But uh, go, another segue that we uh, I missed out on earlier is – I tried. I know you did. I know you did, and I appreciate that, Paul. Ah. Um, but uh, so – 
you know, there's another reason that I asked you to be here, Neil. And one of the things that you do for a living, I'm a, I'm a huge fan of voice actors. I think that they are so much more interesting than uh, the old meat puppet actors, uh, because <laughs> because because uh, you you're know, such a charmer. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to get the actors of the show now, but no, but because. Neil has to do everything with his voice. He's got to evoke a character. He's got to make me believe in this person just with his voice. And if you watch an animated feature, uh, especially in today's traditional animation, you know, we're past the age of Pinocchio and Chuck Jones. Animation, for the most part, isn't as good as it used to be. Uh, the voice carries a lot in this, right? And so he has to find a character with, like, just like this. You heard him doing it where he was able to evoke this bitter guy, the red shirt on Star Trek, and he captures that just with a different kind of inflection, intonation, and whatnot. By the way, I'm, I'm really impressed that you managed not to like turn bitter beaver back on me but <laughs> <laughs> because I've, I've been trying to get to this topic yeah, here that i've been great. dying to ask you guys about and, and you know writing characters is really hard every we've talked on the show before about character design mm -hmm. how you design a character that's instantly recognizable one of the things that neil does for a living is he designs a character who's instantly recognizable by the tone of the voice um and then paul as a writer i'm sure you're thinking all the time about how do i find a way to have this character say this as only they could say it. So, and especially when you're writing things like you've written for DC. I have. You've got to write characters who lots and lots of people know, and they're familiar yeah. with what's the right way this character talks, yeah. right? Batman can't sound like... Batman you know, doesn't say, what's up? No. <laughs> no that's an easy way. Certain, cer certain things that you have to you have to capture the the vocal, the, the, and, and even sometimes the cadence. Um, right. which is hard to do just And, that, and just that's why first. Kevin Conroy is the one and only Batman, right? Because only he did it right. Oh, now you're you're dissing Adam West now? Uh, well, Adam West is good, too. But I'm, I'm and, thinking... and he also did voiceover for some of the early Batman cartoons. Uh, you know, guys, I, I, I got to say, I, I liked what Reno Romano did with it, you know? I, you know, I, he, Jersey is kind of a snob, and he's, like, always oh, looking for it. the, I mean, for the one true thing. <laughs> He's not open to interpretation, and I know, love so. interpretation. I'm just saying that I got a problem with the current Batman, where he sounds like well, I don't know what that noise is that that guy makes. That that uh, the guy who's playing him right now in the movies, the blah, 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 blah thing. Where, you know what I'm talking about? <laughs> yeah, no, I I I, I, I do. And, yeah. and well, look, if that's the one flaw in those films, all right, that, I'll yeah, deal he, with that it. you're picking up on, yeah. No, yeah. and and of he course, like you know monster. that's. Yeah, that's a different situation because, uh, I mean, cinematically, you know, they're aided by by the lighting. They're they're aided by the fact that uh, we can read their lips sometimes. Uh, we can see their faces. Um, you know, uh, so maybe uh, they can get away with with things that are a little harder to interpret. Or it could be the eighty seven speakers that they have in the uh, theaters. Oh yeah, yeah. That, could be part of that the does picture. probably <laughs> help a little bit. Yeah. Somebody's asking in the chat. Uh, uh, Purple box. Uh, Renee Van Belton is asking uh, Neil who your voice acting heroes are. Do you have any? Oh, sh absolutely. Um, I mean, look. I, 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 one of the proudest moments of my life was having the chance one night uh, to work with Mel Blanc. Okay. Oh wow! Um, it was a. It was a. Um, it was a fundraiser for a children's musical theater that I was uh, working with at the time. And uh, he um, it was just amazing. Oh, geez, sorry. I've been distracted by uh, uh, a call from my agent, um, which will uh, return after this is over. Sorry. <laughs> Some things just have to wait. Anyhow, um, but Mel... Up until that point in time, I was I was a, a kid who did impressions, and so you know I was a twelve year old who did Jimmy Carter, or <laughs> or, 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 or Jimmy Stewart, you know, and and, and and of course with Jimmy Stewart, there's always the difference between the young Jimmy Stewart. What would you like me to lash on the moon for you, Mary? On 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 the old Jim, Jimmy Stewart. Oh wow. Who would, uh, be on 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 with uh, Johnny Carson, you know. And the Campbell and, uh, Chunky Super. So I did those sorts of things. And boy, when you're a fourth grader doing that, you are popular with the ladies. <laughs> um, what happens so, when you get to ninth grade, though? <laughs> well, then you meet Mel Blank and he says, eh, impressions are for hacks. Oh, my. Nobody, nobody, nobody does that. Nobody wants that. Um, do original characters. 
And I pretty much a uh, uh, pot when look when God speaks to you, um, you listen. And I pretty much let go of impressions and just more at that point started having my guidance from sketch work that I was seeing on Saturday Night Live. Um, you know, I certainly love the work of Dawes Butler, Paul Fries. Oh, for crying out loud, yeah. Um, and and these were these were guys that you know cre- either created original characters or did impressions that were so bad that they ended up creating new characters out of that. And so I started more doing work I- in that respect. I mean, um, look, well, one of my happiest moments in my professional career was working with Dick Godier, who um, oh, wow. voiceover fans might know as Rodimus Prime. Also a cartoonist. Uh, original, uh, yeah, really? uh, an amazing artist. Um, I just remember him from when things were rotten. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Very nice. You scored points with that one. Oh, nice pull. Nice. Woo! Hit the bullseye, but, so to speak. Of course, Hi- Jaime the Robot. Oh, yeah. Uh, um, and Broadway's original, Conrad Birdie. But let's, enough, enough about Dick Godier. <laughs> Um, Is there ever but, enough about Dick Godier? Uh, no, not really. Okay. But <laughs> we might bore everybody out there in Cyberland. Yeah, that's not, um, not quite in our other, other generation. Fa- uh, so. uh, other heroes, I mean, uh, y- you know, certainly it, within the industry now, um, Billy West, uh, Maurice uh, LaMarche. Yeah. I mean, those guys are are so amazing when it comes to creating characters you know uh, uh, phil lamar i mean and look they're all on one show so I know. yeah as i say have a half hour you know <laughs> what to do with that um, uh, those guys are just absolutely brilliant um so so i'm wondering if you could identify neil what is it that they do that's so brilliant i mean how or you can speak from your own experience they, if you can they, it's like when somebody throws a, a drawing in front of you and says like Find a life for this character. How do you, how do you get into that? Well, I mean, certainly one of the reasons that they're so good is they create characters. They don't do voices, you yeah. know. And and I, I had if you ever watch Billy do a scene with his three characters in Futurama, um, you'll see a physical change within him when he goes from character to character. And he's obviously so familiar with these characters that he's able to pull them at random um, and, and, and get right to them. And, and they're also written differently. They're written with those voices. So, you know, he's, he's not going to end up, you know, having a, a fry line and read it like Zoidberg. You right. know, it's just not going to happen because it's a fry line. You know, and he knows that and he reads that and the writers wrote it that way. Now, me, when I'm doing a character, it, we get different sources and, and that's the information that we get. Maybe it's a picture. Maybe it's a description. Maybe it's both. Maybe it's dialogue. And so it's tapping into where does that live within me um, and what kind of size are we giving this character? I mean, that's one of my biggest questions that I, I'll, I'll ask a creator is how big, <laughs> you know? I mean, because well, two of my two of my video game characters that I'm known for right now, uh, you know, Tychus Finley from StarCraft and Skadge from Star Wars: the The Old Republic, and people ask me, well, you know what can you tell me about Skadge? I know Tychus, and I say, simple. If the two of them got into a bar fight, the first casualty would be the bar. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I mean, these are these are big characters, and so I reach to a place where, you know, that bigger sound kind of comes from, and then you work from there, and it's a matter of intention and what they look like and what their face might be. You know, and 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 you mix that stuff up, and and you know, let's say that that the dialogue for somebody who's who's gigantic like that is a little softer and more timid. No, 
Well, you guys understand. It's a whole different kind of a character. And then you tell me that he's Scottish, in fact. Oh, he's <laughs> shitty. <laughs> well, don't want to talk to no more about this. This is crazy. I gotta go. Oh my gosh, mm-hmm. it's like it's like watching a magic trick every time yeah. I hear somebody do that. Yeah. But you're gonna say yeah. something, Paul. You just ring a bell I'm, with you. I, well, I, what I'm really interested in is when you are writing, how vocal do you get uh, in developing character voices? I mean, do you find yourself, you know, yeah. it, playing around with that? Uh, you know, well, I mean, I'll I'll, re- I'll read a line or a, a line a, a, aloud and and see how it strikes my ear, I think, you know, I mean, look, I've got a lot of stuff on the shelves. I'm trying to, <laughs> I'm trying to get produced, but ultimately it's, um, I write what I'd want to see, what I'd want to hear, you know? Mm-hmm. Uh, and I guess I kind of play characters the same way, you right. know, it's, um, I'm, I'm, I'm a fan of enough different stuff, uh, whether it's, um, plays or movies or tv and or just human beings you know and and it's it's just got to strike my ear right i guess mm-hmm. so, it's, so it's yeah I do, I do, I do. it's it's like a trial and error fooling around with it feeling it out sometimes right is that what you're saying yeah yeah and, and certainly when i'm in the booth and i'm and i'm um and um, I'm doing a line. I mean, I'll, I'll give it more of a, a physical interpretation as well to see how it feels, you know? I want to hear from Paul on this because as a writer, I'm wondering if you do that. Do you act out your scenes? Because I know I do. When I'm writing, I'm actually pacing the room, and I'm trying to feel out the scene with my body. Um, I, I, It varies. It yeah. varies a little bit, but uh, I also spend a lot of time just visualizing it rather than, than working it through. Mm. Um, physically, um, I find fight scenes is where I tend to do the most physicality. But, um, but yeah, I it, you know it's it's important to you gotta yeah you have to have a sense of of you know where people are in the in the scene and how they're how they're relating to each other. So yeah, there's. There's a certain amount of that. Where, well, but I'm not even talking yeah. about like also like you're blocking, like using yeah. old stage terminology, like where are all the now, elements. Sometimes blocking helps, though. With, sure, yeah. sure, absolutely. But I'm talking about like like I'm just working out what my because our characters. One of the, the analogies I use in my comics classes is when you're making comics, you're the director, the cinematographer, the editor, and every actor on the stage, and that's like a, a cool power in a way, but it's also a huge responsibility, right? Mm-hmm. And so you, I try to think of my characters as actors, and I thought it was interesting, Neil, that you said earlier that you got to find something in you. Like, where is the part of you that can speak to this character, right? And it reminds me of the thing that writers say, write what you know, but that doesn't just mean, like, write about your life. It means look at all the characters you've met in your life. Look at all of your reactions to these characters. Dig into yourself and find... Well, what... look, I mean... You know, for an example, I was using this this weekend. I, I did a show called The Mouse and the Monster, and in one episode, I played a stomach. Okay? <laughs> <laughs> now he was having a conversation with the heart, and you know, the heart was like this really good natured voice uh, from another actor, and and I figured, what's the counterpoint? Because you know, um, the heart's actually tired of living inside of this monster so he wants to go out and see the world and the stomach reacts oh great it'll be nice without you you know worried about fat and hot and arteries so basically it was a relationship <laughs> between two co-workers mm. you know who just one was stifling the other one yeah. from you know sure he, he was making things more efficient he was making the the you know both uh achieve their their goals but ultimately he was making for a really dull workplace and i i think i can certainly access that um i mean look i i don't think you have to go with method acting and and really live everything (laughs) what i tell people is voice acting is the closest thing to being a six-year-old other than being five (laughs) yeah (laughs) Because you use your imagination. I mean, yeah. um, when you're six year old and you've got a, a, a red towel around your neck, yeah. adults have to actually have to tell you that you can't fly. 
Oh, man, man, thank you for that. This is something I also say in my classrooms. I teach some adult classes as well, and sometimes adults get a uh, – they've, they've gotten far enough along their life without having to draw or tell stories that they've sufficiently been uh, indoctrinated with this idea that they can't, right? And so mm-hmm. a lot of my job is, is telling them that they can. And when they like, where do you get your ideas? How do you come up with characters? I'm like, look, it's just like when you were on the playground as a little kid. It's exactly the same thing. You say, deflector shield, I shoot a laser at you, and you're, you're talking out this whole story with your friends, coming up with a story on the fly on the playground. It's exactly the same skill set, right? The only thing that matters is you've got to have rules, and you've got to follow those rules. Now, if your rules mean that people can walk on the ceilings and the roof, then that's fine as long as you – you know, stick to stick to your rules, no matter what they are, no matter how crazy it is. Your internal um, consistency. What, whether it's a guy, you know, whether it's uh, um, a guy who's, uh, you know, uh, undefeatable because he talks to fish. <laughs> <laughs> Right. You know, well, I mean, well, suddenly is... you can't give him heat laser beams coming out of his eyes. <laughs> you know, he's got to stick with talking to the salmon and going, hey, intercept that nuclear missile for me, won't you? <laughs> By the way, speaking of voice acting, casting Ernest Borgnine as the Aquaman stand in on SpongeBob SquarePants was one of the greatest casting choices I've ever heard in my life. Uh, have you guys seen that? No, I, no. I, ha- I have not, but. <laughs> he plays no, he plays an aging it. an aging Aquaman called Mermaid Man and it's Mermaid Man and Barnacle Boy instead of Aquaman and Aqualad and they they cast Ernest Borgnine as Mermaid Man and um, Tim Conway as Barnacle Boy oh my gosh that was Tim Conway as Barnacle Boy <laughs> yeah. okay and they're at an old folks home it's it's uh, it's and, and 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 wasn't that the most appropriate place for McHale's Navy reunion yeah. <laughs> <laughs> But uh, anyway, well, okay, so so it comes- well, you see, I mean, the, uh, look, g- good casting is good casting, you mm-hmm. know. And but the other thing you've got to remember is when stuff like that works, um, a lot of times the un- unsung hero there is is the director, mm-hmm. you know. Um, when when a video game works, when you're when you're watching a cut scene, um, a lot of that has to do with the director having the capacity to direct actors who um, are working four days apart. That's true. We should men- make a mention of that. Like another challenge of, of your line of work these days is a lot of times it's not at the big old Sunbow studio or the Wally Burr studios with you guys all standing around a table doing a table read, right? It's a lot of the stuff well, is recorded days they, apart. They still do that for most original TV animation, um, but unfortunately uh, – I'm not booking those as often as I'd like, but you know, hopefully that'll be changing real soon. But yeah, certainly when you're doing anime and you're dubbing, or when you're doing uh, an audio book, or you're doing a video game, and you know, my work these days is predominantly video game work, um, you're working alone. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So in those cases, the director kind of becomes a collaborator on the storytelling, like giving you a sense of like, well, maybe you could push it in this direction a little bit, get a little bit like grab more gravelly, a little deeper, giving you a sense of what kind of character you're trying to find. No, not no, not so much that. It's more along the lines of this is the emo, uh, this is the emotional uh, situation. I mean, it's if if Andrea Romano, by the way, who's you know, like seriously, if, if she's not. The, the best director in, in the industry, the um, certainly the conversation starts there. Um, but she directed StarCraft II. And, uh, you know, Robert Clotworthy and I never worked in the same room at the same time. And if you watch those cutscenes, you'd never think that. And that's obviously, you know, a big tip of the hat to her because, look, if I'm playing the scene really loud and Robert's playing it soft, then it seems like we're in two different rooms. Mm-hmm. You know, she's not only got to pr- let us know the proximity to the other actors, the emotional intention, um, the emotional interplay. Because again, if I'm playing it in a different style or a different manner, that's like, you know, that's like having half your panels being a manga style and half your panels being a Jim Lee style. Yeah. Yeah. 
Uh, we're getting a technical question in the chat. What's your favorite microphone, Neil? Do you have one? Um, not not so much. I mean, you know, obviously, if you if you got the money for a Neumann, um, I mean, that's not only a good mic, but it's fun to say. Um, <laughs> but there are lots of good ones out there, and and you know, I do most of my recording actually in studio. Yeah. So that's up to the uh, genius behind the control board. Okay. Well, I have only one more thing, and then I'm going to let you uh, go and call your agent and nurse that uh, sinus infection and maybe catch a <laughs> nap. Uh, but uh, Dan Gilvison wrote a book, Bumblebee and Me, Life as a G1 Transformer, a story about Dan Gilvison, the, the right. actor who played the original Bumblebee in the original cartoon series. And it, it, he did an audio book of it, so I got to re or listen to this book read by yes. the guy talking about like what his life as a voice actor, what it's like in the studio, and then a few out-of-school stories about like, what happened in the control room and as i'm right. listening to this i'm like for god's sakes why doesn't neil kaplan write a book like this please uh you don't have to write a how-to book like tara and yuri did but uh if you i'm just saying and I'm, I'm sure other people in the chat will agree with me if you decide to do like a little memoir kind of thing where you actually read well, it well i am um, you know i'm actually looking more along the lines of getting back on the uh, stand-up stage really you know, and and using the those kind of stories every now and then um no, you know, I, I appreciate that. That's very kind. But I always, when I when I think about it, you know, as far as a memoir goes, um, I think there are so many other more interesting people in in this industry. Um, you know, I, I guess uh, I guess I keep myself humble, um, or at least I try to, um, yeah. because look, um, the thing that kind of uh, goosed my career a little bit was walking in another actor's shoes. Um, an actor who has a worldwide following, deservedly so, um, has has done a wonderful work. Um, but certainly there's no shortage of people um, on the internet or at conventions that are willing to let me know that uh, I'm not him. Oh, and, really? And uh, yeah, and, and then that's okay because look, I, I'm fan. I'm a fan of other people's work, and uh, and it's and it's all well intentioned. Um, you take it with a grain of salt. Um, I guess it's one of the reasons why creating a character um, like Tychus Finley is is really close to my heart. Yeah. Because yeah. Uh, that's at least to this point in time, uh, mine and mine alone so far. Um, and I can, I, I appreciate where the fans are coming from and, and, uh, you know, that, that, that's all good. And so again, you know, it just doesn't let me get full of myself to the point where I think I'm, I'm, I'm that important, you know? Well, that that's that's incredibly modest of you, but uh, but yeah, just you know, for what it's worth, uh, you know, you did a pretty important. Uh, in, well, we were talking earlier about interpretation and me being open to interpretation or yeah. not, Paul. Yeah, uh, yeah I, th I think Neil's Optimus Prime is uh, pretty darn good, and I wish they would have cast him for the new Transformers Prime series. I really do. Uh, as much well, as I... you know, uh, look, anybody's always welcome to write letters. <laughs> That's true. Let's send some emails. What people. are what are no no letters? no 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 no? Oh, you mean you mean, you mean paper? Are, email no. anybody can send an email. <laughs> if you really mean it, put pen to paper yeah. and put it in the mail and save the post office. Yeah, you know. <laughs> save the post office while you're at it. There you go. Well, not only save the post office, but then you can use the you can go get the Pixar stamps, and those are really cool. Oh, there you go. Um, and and the fact of it is that it. I mean, look, I, I certainly would love it if people would, would do something like that uh, um, in, in support of work that I've done. It's, it's very nice. But think about it. I mean, you guys do work that fans appreciate. When you get an email, that's nice. But when you get it, a, a, an actual note or a card in the mail, I mean, who does that anymore? That really <laughs> means something. I was going to say, no one. <laughs> yeah, I know. I, I don't think I, I, very I think few I, people. So, yeah. like, let's say that they did get ten letters in the mail. That might actually get somebody a cameo. Well, there you go. You know, right. and certainly, you know, um, I wouldn't be adverse to working with Michael Bay in in Transformers Four, a new reboot. <laughs> 
All right. Well, duly noted. Uh, but uh, so I want to I want to give before we let you go. Uh, anything you want to point yeah. people at that we didn't mention, or anything they want to give put underline in black crayon? Like visit this today, please. Well, you know, I do actually run a nonprofit um, called yeah. Audio Theater for Our Troops, which you can find at atfot.org. That's www.atfot.org. And that's all about uh, hopefully creating a, a nice big fat library for our men and women in, in uh, military service to be able to uh, listen to and get some entertainment because anybody who's ever sat on an airplane and tried to watch a movie on an iPod or on that little screen understands that your peripheral vision still shows you you're on a plane. Yeah, but if yeah. you've ever listened to an audiobook like Heaven's Devils um, <laughs> and you close your eyes for a couple of minutes, you know, for a little bit, and I'm not saying for a long time, but for a moment, you're transported. You're someplace else. Yeah. And yeah. if you think about men and women who – work on a submarine or an aircraft carrier or even are on a on a base you know in korea or germany when they're off duty they're still at work yeah. yep absolutely you know and so if i can get the voiceover community the voice acting community together and, and record some stuff and give them a little bit of entertainment as as our way of saying thank you um mp3 files take up very little space on a hard drive or on an mp3 player and it's just it's it's something i want to do to say uh thank you for doing what you do um and allowing goofballs like me to do what i do that is super cool neil so yeah thank you for mentioning that too um so okay well we'll let you go and oh, oh yeah oh yeah oh yeah. oh yeah and also um you know i volunteer at the uh, braille institute for the blind so uh if you want to, uh, I also think if, if you're interested in voice acting, a great place to get uh, good experience is to read at your local Braille Institute or reading for the blind and dis di I'm sorry, dyslexic. Um, um, because, you know, if you can read short stories, it gives you the chance to work on creating characters. That is great advice, and yes, and I hope I hope that we can work things out to get you out here for Kids Read Comics one of these years. Uh, and I really, you know, you know how much I really want to do it. I really do. That would be great to have you come out and actually lead a couple workshops on how to do what you do. That would be so much fun and be a big thrill for me. So, but but this was an equally big thrill getting to talk to you again. It was it's been too long, and thank you so much for making time to be on the show, Neil. Real pleasure. My pleasure. Meeting you, My Neil. pleasure. Thank you both. All right, have, have a good day, Neil, and take care of that cold or that infection. Yeah. <laughs> take care of that infection. <laughs> Feel better. Yeah. Feel better. Thank you. Yeah, yeah coming yeah. up next, open and infected. <laughs> Thanks, Neil. Bye. 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 Okay, so now we're going to shift gears over to the book recommendation segment. Um, and uh, should, should I do my recommendation real quick? You should quick do yours before... real quick before we switch chairs. Uh, let Sharon okay. Iverson and I just, I just is... want to keep Sharon standing around I, I, in the yes, studio for as long as possible. So I, I'm going to hold up uh, hold up my book. Uh, it is uh, it is Allison Dare. Uh, it is by uh, the two J's, uh, J Torres and J Bone. Um, Initial J, not uh, not J A Y. J -A -Y yeah. And um, and and it's about a, a little girl whose mom is an archaeologist and her dad is a superhero. Mm. And uh, these are two phenomenally ta talented guys um, doing a really really fun book for all ages that that all ages can enjoy. Um, it's 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 fun. It's kind of goofy from time to time. Uh, it's gorgeous. Uh, uh, I, w I worked with Jay uh, a Bone on. It. He helped out with the Gotham Girls. He did the uh, the inking and a I believe a little uh, some of the some of the layouts on uh, uh, oh. one of them. And uh, he's just phenomenally talented. Uh, they're both uh, also working on um, Saturday morning webtoons. I believe. Oh, with Eric uh, Orchard and those guys. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, and. It, it, that's great stuff as well. So, uh, well, worth Saturday that. morning webtoons, a yep. new comic or two every Saturday for you know it's kid friendly yep. stuff yep. and funny stuff and exactly. yeah, Eric Orchard who's getting I got to get Eric on the show because I mention him like every other episode. Uh, Inky yep. Bat on Twitter. Uh, and, and now I should probably uh, let Sharon have the seat. Yeah, I guess if you want, you can let Sharon have the seat. <laughs> okay. well, uh, you know, it seems it seems the thing to so do. So we're gonna pull so the old I'll, switcher. I'll probably, I'll probably be back for uh, for the uh, final for thoughts. The 
for the, oh, there for the tease, for, for the tease. Yes, you will be back. All but right. yes, Paul's story of Storyville.com, Storyville on Twitter, Storyville on Facebook. Uh, no, Paul D. Story on Facebook. Oh, I know. I, you I'm, skunked it. I think I need to, I think I need to change it. But, <laughs> but that's, you can find Paul wherever it, uh, you can find Wh- it. Wherever Storyvilles are sold. <laughs> <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> <laughs> Any place where there's people talking about comics, Paul is there peeking his head around going, well, you guys talking about me? You talking about me? <laughs> Can I be part of this? Uh, I, but, I'm, I'm like uh, Courtney Cox's character on uh, on Cougar Town last night. She was the... She's the the eavesdropping ninja. <laughs> Anybody starts talking about her, it's like, was was that about me? <laughs> <laughs> so, but right. yes, so thank you, Paul, for being on the show. My again. pleasure, all, as always, Jersey. I, I think you scored me some points with Neil, with it, which I appreciate, with all of your old timey references. You're very welcome. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so while we while Sharon takes the stand, um, I wanted to make some noise about some stuff. Um, let's see, there's some things going on at ADL, and uh, one of which. Is oh, let me see if I can pull it up. Uh, I think we can make a noise about this now. Uh, comics dot aadl dot org. Yes, Sharon Iverson. Yeah. Oh, it's up and it's working. Look, look at this. Oh my gosh, it's a lot more than when I looked the other day. Oh, oh look at this. Wow. Cool. So yes, uh, if if everybody who's listening now wants to go to comics dot aadl dot org. Man, we've been working for a long time mm-hmm. on this. Mm-hmm. I'm so excited about it. Comics yeah. are great was the first step towards building this yep. new thing where there's a subdomain website on the library's website with us highlighting all of the different comics events going on, different books in the collection, the podcast that we're doing. This mm-hmm. is the place now to get the video podcast. I've been mm-hmm. holding out on releasing a video podcast of the show. I wanted ADL to have first dibs on that. So you can go there to subscribe to the show's video feed. You don't have to just get on the YouTube anymore. Um, and there's even in the uh, upper right corner of the site a featured artist section. Yeah, and uh, I see Gail. There's Gail Williams of patbird.gailsor.com. A little refresh, and then what do we get? Oh, we got Gail again. I saw I got Katie first. Katie Cook is on there. Paul Story is on there Ooh. too. So, oh, and there's uh, Jim. Uh, Padaviani. Uh, Ad- uh, yep, uh, with his book Feynman. Feynman. So we're using it also as a way to let the local community know about the awesome cartoonists mm-hmm. in the area and the work that they're doing. So, mm-hmm. oh my gosh, I'm so I'm so stoked on this. This is awesome. Mm-hmm. So I gotta I gotta stop and thank Matt Dubé. I gotta thank Eli Nyberger. I gotta thank uh, Andrew McLaren and all the folks in the IT department for putting this thing together. It looks really great. I'm so so juiced. Oh, and there's the uh, events blog on there right. too. Right. Well, so. I, I haven't put up the blog yet, and Paul got away, or at least is outside the door, but we've got Paul coming on the 4th of March, Sunday, mm-hmm. from 1 to 3 right here at the Downtown Library to talk about um, how you can, um, as a comics writer, do your best to help the artistic side, the, the letters, the, the artists, um, execute the story that mm-hmm. you are telling. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So super cool. So that's at the Free uh, Comics Artist Forum uh, Sunday, what did you say, March? Sunday, March 4th. 4th from 1 to 3 p.m. 1 to, 1 to 3 p.m. On, in the 4th floor. 4th floor conference room, everybody. Me- meeting room. Oh, meeting room. Because there's also a conference room. So, oh, that's so right. So we want to make sure they know it's the meeting room. And Eric E-G-K- EJK on the Twitters is posting into the chat for us, comics.adl.org slash events slash list question mark ID equals 13935. <laughs> no one will remember that, but it will be in the show notes, everybody. Yep. Yep. Uh, okay, so and then there's another event that I wanted to make a note of. Uh, convention season is upon us. Uh, people are going to get ready to start going to all sorts of different kinds of comic conventions, whether it be Detroit Fanfare or MoCA or SPX, uh, Chicago Comic Con, whatever. Um, Tyler James, a uh, friend of friend of the show, friend of the Lean Into Art thing that I do with Rob Stenzinger, leanintoart.com, he's going to lead a workshop for us there uh, called Absolute Consense with Tyler James, and that's at leanintoart.com slash workshops. And I want to read the description because um, – and this, this is going to be uh, end of March. Registration is open now, and uh, we have early bird pricing on it for the first week. So right now you get it for $42. You get a, an hour and a half workshop, 50 strategies to double your fund, triple your contacts, and quadruple your profits at your next comic book convention. A lot of good information from Tyler James of Comics Tribe. He's the guy who spearheads the uh, 30 Characters in 30 Days uh, event every year. A uh, really smart guy. He's going to do an hour and a half presentation for us with follow-up in the forums at leanintoart.com slash workshops. Sign up this week, and you get the early bird special pricing. Then the price goes up 
after that. So I wanted to make a note of that just in terms of like comics events, comics program, mm -hmm. comics education. Mm -hmm. So did you bring some books? Under the table they are. <laughs> okay, Yoda. No, no, I'll bring them above the table. All right, um, and, we can move this. And I think you know that I'm sometimes a sucker for the nonfiction biography area. And you have to hold it up to there. Okay, there you go. this one's shiny, so I'm holding it up. It's 21, the story of Roberto Clemente. Um, both the books I'm mentioning today were named to the great graphic novels by um, a committee – the Great Graphic Novels Committee um, of YALSA, the Young Adult Library Services Association. Um, and it's his, it's his story of his life, but it's done by um, a gen gentleman named Wilfred Santiago, who is also from Puerto Rico, as was Roberto Clemente, and brings to the reader um, a lot of insight of, of Clemente, not so much as he is the baseball player, which it does highlight that, but also um, his childhood, his where he came from and where he went back to after every season ended because um, many of you may know that today there's a Roberto Clemente award given for any baseball player who's involved in humanitarian activities. And in 1972, at the end of his um, record season in which he hit his 3,000th hit, um, he was on his way to Nicaragua to bring supplies after an earthquake. Um, he was on this fourth plane because the first three were supposedly uh, commandeered by, um, I forget who was leading the government at the time, but um, fell into the wrong hands, we'll put it that way. So he was going to be there personally with it, and the plane did not make it. It, it crashed into the ocean. Um, so anyway, one of the things I just want to mention that's kind of cool about the book is the, the sepia tone. The, to me, this was not an easy read. I read it a couple of times, um, mm -hmm. partly because I was not familiar with all the people in uh, Clemente's life, but also sometimes the layout was a little challenging. Um, but I went back through it a couple times, and it really is amazing how much is packed about him, about the the way of life, the culture of the time, and the sepia kind of takes you back. Mm -hmm. And it, and it's interesting that it's just you know bare bones color, and and I didn't plan this, but the other book that I have um, that we've talked about, Marzi, yes, is Marzi. And Marzi, when I read it the first time, it's uh, let me kind of back up. Marzi is by Marzina, and I do not know if I'm saying it, it's S O W A so Silva. Sova. That would be my guess. And she is the writer and her partner, Sylvain <laughs> Savoya. And I'm, Savoya. I'm butchering that, I am sure, um, illustrated it. And it's the story of um, her life as a child growing up in a Poland that was going through tremendous change. She was born in 1979, and 10 years later, um, I guess we call it solidarity. I'm sure it was pronounced differently, but um, is coming to the fore and pushing the government um, to make significant reforms. And what I love about this book, too, I re originally read it in an advanced reader copy, and it was all in gray and black and white tones. And then I got the library copy, which, of course, is the one issued. And but there's still these muted tones. Very muted. Um, her eyes are what caught struck me um, because the cover shows her as blue-eyed, but throughout the book, um, I'd be curious to ask why her eyes are not, you know, complementarily colored. Um, Interesting. But very expressive, very expressive, and I'm, of course, I don't even know if I've got pictures of her um, showing through. Yeah, this page maybe has some others. Her well, it looks like he's he, or she's working with a very limited color palette. It's all warm colors. Yeah. Uh, there's no cool colors in there at all. I'm not seeing any blues. Right. Uh, the closest you get is like kind of like a, a warmish gray. Right. So. And I, it, it, you know, it doesn't bother me at all. It just, you know, it was kind of interesting to translate. Because even on the back cover, she's got brownish yeah, eyes. Yeah, yeah. Weird. Yeah. So it's it's an amazing story, very much uh, to be compared to Persepolis um, mm -hmm. in the fact that, you know, here are some young people who were caught, and she was much younger at the time. Um, it, it talks about she's still a kid, and she's still got kid things going on, and, you know, but around her and, and through and everything, she is experiencing um, the changes that are coming, and 
not being a grown up. Um, sometimes she's realizing it's probably better not to be a grown up. Um, you know, she's sort of invisible to it all, but quite the observer mm. of, of what's happening around. So highly recommend both these two biographies. Super cool. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Those, those uh, I, at least I can speak for Marzi. That's a, it's a great looking book. Mm -hmm. I have not read it all the way through yet. Okay, I got some book recommendations. I want to start with Cowboys and Robots, uh, two of my favorite things that go great <laughs> together. And uh, for years, I've wanted to do a Wild West story with robots. And then uh, two great cartoonists did it before me, so now there's no need to. I'm off the hook. Uh, first one is Daisy Cutter by Kaz uh, Kazu uh, Kazu uh, Kibuishi. And yes, uh, this is in the library's collection. Awesome. Yeah. yeah. The whole the whole collected version. I got the first version with the from Viper Comics with the Neat. two chapters but it's a wild west story with a lot it's got a lot of fun a lot of uh, action adventure a lot of heart and it also features um all sorts of i don't know if this is going to show up on camera but like cowboy robots and in drawn in kazoo style oh come on give me a break it's gonna be a great book yeah you said daisy's you read one tough cookie Yes, she is, and it's got an <laughs> awesome chase on a train with a robot that has guns bristling out of everywhere. The next mm -hmm. one, another cowboy robot story, is Iron mm -hmm. West by Doug Tenafel. Uh, this, again, cowboy robots, what more do you need to know? But it's Doug Tenafel, great storyteller, creator of Earthworm Jim, uh, Rat Fist, uh, done a lot, a lot, I think he's done like 14 or, th or 30 graphic novels. Wow. Um, maybe 50 now and he's like you know he's just the guy cranks out a graphic novel in his sleep but it's it's uh really fun energetic stuff really kind of like uh brushy lines uh pure black and white mm -hmm. art but it's also just a super super fun read you'll blast through it and then you won't be sorry for getting it um and then mm -hmm. i checked this is not in the library's collection yet. i we know have to work on this i know i know um, i know i didn't mean to put you on the spot i no. know you're not the selector though so this no. is not your fault no but i need to pass that word on it's yes because this job. is you know, I I used to have Casey on the show all the time. Uh, mm -hmm. I need to get her on the show again. Casey Van Heis of wintersandlavelle.com did this mm -hmm. great book called Winters and Lavelle. You, you've read this one, yeah. right? Yeah, yep. I and own it. Yeah, she uh, she described it as uh, sort of like Chronicles of Narnia as if Edmund and Lucy were the only ones who went, right? And so it's this uh, young kind of uh, – uh, obstreperous boy and his and his uh, innocent, wide-eyed, sweet sister who uh, find this orb that allows them to transport to this mythical place. And uh, there's these scary deer men, and there's all sorts of uh, political intrigue with these different princes. And they start to develop these strange powers while they're there. So it's super fun. Uh, fantasy, I would recommend this to uh, young girls uh, or anybody who enjoys entertainment that young girls enjoy. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, and, and plus, Casey's art is just gorgeous. It's one yes, of my it favorite is. comics updating mm -hmm. on the internet right now at wintersandlavelle.com. But the volume one is available on the site, and we need to get more. Any librarians watching out there, put yeah. this in your collection yes. for your young ladies. You and I want to know when volume two will come. She's working on it. I know, I know, I know. It. And, yeah, she's Space Case with a K on the Twitters if you want to follow her. She also posts really uh, <laughs> sometimes very angry thoughts, sometimes very funny thoughts on Twitter. <laughs> but, yeah, good old Casey. Uh, I need to get her on the show again. But uh, in the meantime, you yeah, should check out her comic if you haven't already. Um, and then speaking of Doug Tenaple, I also wanted to throw out one plug while we're on the topic of comics cartoonists. Doug Tenaple was on another comic show that if you haven't checked out, you should. It's called Making Comics, the Making Comics podcast, and that's at makingcomics.com. They recently did a two-parter with interviewing Doug Tenaple about his work and his philosophy. Uh, they also had the fellow – and I'm, I'm – Oh, I'm blanking on his name. The guy who works on Axe Cop, uh, well-known cartoonist, and now I'm, uh, somebody's gonna, lots of people are going to correct me. Um, but uh, really, really great show, uh, two-parter, fantastic listening. If you like this kind of talk, I know you'll love uh, that show too. So giving them a little plug uh, for Doug Tenaple, tenaple.com, and makingcomics.com. So anything else that we need to make any noise about, Sharon? Uh, no, I don't know. Just be sure to check the, the new website. Um, if you're around AAD or around Ann Arbor on the weekend of March 3rd and 4th, drop in on the 4th and yeah. um, take in the next forum. Yep. So, man, once again, I have to thank you guys mm -hmm. for all this great support you're giving to all the comics programming. <laughs> oh, man. This is even better than last year when I opened up that access guide and saw all that comics programming. Mm -hmm. Now i got a freaking website with yeah. all the stuff, events, the podcast, the comics home with, all, oh, man, featured artists honoring our local cartoonists. Yeah. Oh, I better get I better get to a computer fast because I just did the blog for um, – 
the March Fourth event, and and I wasn't thinking that I could post it right there. Yep, you right gotta now. tag. You gotta tag so it. So I with need to the, get it in there. Yep. Yeah. So okay. So super cool. Well, thanks everybody for listening and watching. Sorry about the technical glitches at the, at the top of the live stream of this one. We had to move it to a different streaming service at the last minute. But Matt Dubé, our producer, came through like a champ, like a hero among men. Uh, I, I saw some ladies lined up outside of the front of the library just crying uh, at the heroism that was going on in the control booth today. <laughs> Poor Matt. Uh, but, but no, he, he really did a good job today. And uh, this show will be available uh, at comics.aadl.org within the next day or so and uh, at comicsagreat.com uh, and on youtube.com slash comicsagreat. Lots of places to get it. Choose your favorite place to get it. And uh, and just remember, we'll be back in two weeks with another show at comicsgreat.tv. And if you use the Comics Great hashtag, then we can put your tweets on the air and you can in interact with the show, as it were. Um, maybe maybe this will be one more way we can twist Sharon's arm oh. into <laughs> getting on Twitter. No, I'm never going to get you on Twitter. But I, I can keep on trying. <laughs> um, but yeah, thanks everybody for listening and watching. Until next time, I've been Jersey Drozd of comicsgreat.com and Jersey on Twitter. Okay, bye. Woohoo. You know, I looked the other day and it was.